2017 was uh, generally a difficult year for quite a number of banks, as you have seen from the financial results that they have just released. But how was it for Bank of Africa? 2017 was a very challenging year for the whole industry, I could say. Because uh, if you look at, as we're entering into 2017, we're just that we had just uh, implemented the interest rate capping, which happened in September 2016. At the same time, private sector credit growth was very low. That dropped to about, f about 4%, and, it, and all signs of it going a bit lower. We knew 2017 is, a, is an election year, and in usually election years also slow down the economy. Uh, the, the presidential elections of the US had just finalized with Trump coming in. And uh, there was a lot of protectionist uh, kind of messages, expelling diasporas. So there's a lot of uncertainty just coming from that. And uh, also FRS 9, a new accounting uh, reporting standard, was meant to be implemented by 20, the start of 2018. So even as we were planning for business in 2017, we had to think of all these all this, uh, risks that we we're going to face. So 2017, what we did as Bank of Africa is embark on a short-term strategy just for that year. And this one was just to rationalize our business and try to maximize on the assets that we have and manage our balance sheet better. Uh, with interest rate capping, one of the challenges uh, we faced is that uh, if you just, just rewind a little bit further, you, 2016 was a difficult year because of Chase Bank. What happened with Chase Bank? And uh, there's a lot of segmentation risk, as the governor says. A lot of money moved from the tier twos and threes to tier ones. And uh, part of the strategies that, uh, that tier twos and threes did to manage that kind of uh, segmentation risk was also to take on expensive liabilities and, and book them for longer term. So when interest rate is capped now, you find that you're, you're sitting on deposits that are expensive and you can only you can only lend them out at a, at a cap rate of 14%. So that became a big problem for most of the tier twos and threes, and also us. So for 2017, what we had to do now is to, to, re, to shrink our balance sheet and also reduce the level of deposits, especially the expensive ones, because there's not, there nothing much you could do with these deposits, because you cannot lend them at 14, with, uh, 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 especially if you're taking care of the risk on the lending side and the OPEX involved in that lending. And also the fixed, uh, the fixed uh, income securities. You find that they were, more, they were very steady throughout. There was little fluctuation on them because the government maintained those rates quite, uh, at, 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 at quite a steady rate. So that didn't give you much opportunity also to invest in the fixed income securities. So what we did now, we had to ma manage our balance sheet better. So we had to reduce our deposit liabilities and, by, and also try to reduce the risk assets whose return was not within a particular threshold. So that's one of the main things we did during 2017. So you'll notice our balance sheet shrunk, but there was more efficiencies in the sense that we saved a lot on interest expense and were also able to reduce our risk, uh, our risk assets. So that was one of the major things we did. The other one now on the rationalization of the business was to make sure that the branches that were not contributing positively to the bank, those ones we closed them off. And, and it was not a difficult decision to close branches because we were still able to serve our clients through technology. What's happening is that you're finding less and less footfall in the branches, especially from the, from the retail sector, which means you don't really need to have too many, a, a, a wide branch network to serve the clients. So in those cases, it was easier to close the branches. But uh, we're also very careful to, to ensure that uh, even as you close the branches, you don't lose out too much on the business and also you don't affect staff too much. So the way we manage the staff, uh, the, the staff numbers was by having a voluntary uh, early retirement uh, package offered. And with that, we're able to get adequate numbers to justify uh, the, our current structure. There's a lot of optimism, especially in the banking sector, that uh, the interest rate capping law is going to be done away with. Are you yourself optimistic that this is actually going to happen? I cannot quite say that I'm optimistic it will be put aside. I think it's going to be tweaked. There, is going, there will definitely be a, a wider framework in which to manage 
consumer credit. Because the capping idea, I, I think the capping was meant to be to deal with consumer credit, not just all credit. Mm. Because uh, the person who has uh, little bargaining power is the, is, is, the, is, is the consumer market. It's not so much the corporate market. And you'll find that corporates are even getting prime rates even before the, yeah. the capping. So it's mostly on the consumer credit part of it. So what, what we're expecting as bankers is a more comprehensive regulation to handle consumer credit. Not so much as the cap being lifted and it's out and, and then we are back to the old, the old ways, no. So do you, do you then uh, agree, or are you actually also concurring that there was something that wasn't also right with the old regime pre-interest rate capping? The old, I think it's not that the old is not good because remember banks had moved into areas because of ability to, to price for risk. We had moved into areas that initially were not there and, were ob and the banks were able to open markets and, uh, and, 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 uh, and have financial inclusion in areas that banks never used to be there. Areas that maybe the, 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 the village loan shark was, uh, was the one handling and exploiting the markets and uh, other, other forms of money lenders. But banks moved there. So it's, we cannot say that uh, the old was bad. What we can say is that uh, banks had commoditized credit. And uh, by so doing, they had almost uh, put everybody at the same at the same level, and they were not differentiating between risks on one particular person and the other. So everybody was just being lent to money at a particular rate, knowing that some will go bad, some will be good. So overall, I, I will operate within a particular risk uh, framework. But now, that is what maybe should change now. Yeah. Now, the, 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 the strategy that most banks have used to count uh, the capping of interest rates have actually been three. One of them is uh, investing a lot more in, in government securities, and the other one has been uh, reducing operational costs. And the third one has been to actually grow their uh, non-interest non income, basically transactions and so on. In your case, I think what you've seen is that you have, uh, of course, reduced your costs, yeah? But then also closed a number of branches which obviously has an impact on your transaction income. What are you actually doing as Bank of Africa to, to grow your other revenue streams? Uh, you, you'll notice, if, if you look at our results, you'll see BO is quite strong on the foreign exchange side. Yes. So you'll see quite, there's a lot of growth on the FX because uh, BOA continues to have one of the, one of the most vibrant and, uh, and competent treasury uh, department. And we are also, because we are a Pan-African uh, bank, we are also able to manage currencies uh, much easier through synergies with other subsidiaries. So that's one of the areas that uh, you will see a lot of revenue growth. You may not see the revenue growth on the, on the fees and commissions from branch operations, but there was. It's just that uh, last year was, as we closed branches also, you, you, we, we were also doing some cleanup on dormant accounts. So there were some reversals of some income from the dormant accounts. So that could have affected also the, the, the trend of the fees and commissions from branch operation. But that too has been increasing because uh, we've been doing a lot of integration uh, through technology uh, with uh, public institutions. Uh, now we've got uh, applications that uh, if you want to pay your taxes through us, you can pay. So customs, KRA taxes, uh, NHIF, all those we have integrated. Uh, Nairobi City Council, we're also integrating. And uh, the, next, the next big thing that we want to do now is, uh, is integrate uh, with, uh, with schools on the school fees payments. So there has been also that drive towards fees and commissions in that direction. IFRS 9 is uh, finally here. All banks are actually required in Kenya to be compliant uh, starting from 2018. What is your position uh, with regard to IFRS 9? Are you already uh, compliant? IFRS 9 is, uh, is going to be, again, another, what I would call a shock to not just Kenya but internationally because it's an, it's an international standard that has to be complied with, with, uh, with uh, institutions all over the world. 
Uh, the biggest challenge with the IFRS 9 compared to the previous uh, standard, which was IAS 9, accounting, the International Accounting uh, Standard number 39, is IFRS 9 requires institutions to take provisions even in, on what was, was considered as a good debt in the past. Because now what we have to do is uh, segment our portfolios and attribute certain risks on that segment to all the, to, to your whole exposure there. So if, for example, you've got uh, a high level of non-performing accounts in manufacturing, mm. like we know in, 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 in Kenya, manufacturing sector is one of the sectors with the highest non-performing accounts. It means that now when you're lending to a new manufacturer, because that sector is perceived to be risky for you, because you have a high, high non-performing on it, you take provisions immediately. So what will happen now is that you will see the, pro the, the level of provisions for banks going up. IFRS 9 also requires you to take provisions for off-balance sheet exposures. In the past, th those are only being taken once it crystallizes. So you will see again provisions being taken for off-balance sheet based again on the same, uh, on the same uh, principles and also on the undrawn commitments. So if, for example, you get an offer, of let an offer letter from a bank and you've not, you've not drawn down but it's accepted. You've accepted the offer and yes, you can draw any time you want. That too, we'll end up taking provisions on that. So generally the provisions in the industry will go up and that's why uh, the, the central bank is uh, studying this carefully because what you don't want is to create uh, unnecessary panic in the market. Because that has a major yeah. impact on the capital. Exactly, it will have a major impact on the capital and it, will also, it can also have a, an impact on the, on the market confidence in the, in the financial sector. So those are things that have to be handled uh, where, since, with, with some degree of sensitivity even as banks implement this new reporting standard. So for BOA, yes, we are prepared. Actually, all banks in Kenya have to, our first reporting will be March, the, 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 this quarter. quarter, this first quarter of March, you'll see, you'll see banks in Kenya showing their degree of compliance with FRS 9. And uh, also for, for 2017, in as much as 2017 was based on IIS 39, they, had, they have to be disclosure notes showing the impact of FRS 9, even on the 2017 results. So all those you'll be seeing on the published accounts of, of, uh, of, of banks. Yeah, so by and large, it is, there's a possibility of uh, increased capital needs. There may be some banks that will be required to, to raise capital. For BO, we're quite prepared. And uh, one, one fortunate thing is that we are part of a, a bigger group of banks. So we believe we, ha we are resilient enough to handle any shocks that could come from uh, IFRS 9. We will follow the regulations of the central bank because uh, currently there's a draft paper which, which, is, uh, which is still yet to be finalized. So we will follow the regulations of the, of the central bank uh, in, in how they want, they want it spread out, especially on the, on, the capital, on the capital plan. The growth of the banking sector obviously will depend a lot on what happens uh, in the macroeconomic environment. Yeah. How bullish are you about the growth of the Kenyan economy? Just even from the reports that we're getting from the central bank, there's a lot of, confi there's a lot of increased confidence levels from the financial sector and also the business sector. Everybody seems quite upbeat this year. Yes, there are some things that could derail uh, expected development. Uh, oil prices also, they're they are pushing up. That could affect us as, as, as a country. We are seeing problems between uh, the trade problems between uh, US, and US and China, China, exactly. Those could spill over and also affect us. Uh, FRS 9 is there coming in and uh, maybe you might, you might find situations where banks completely avoid certain uh, sectors because they risk or find other ways to mitigate, which could be difficult because certain sectors, look at manufacturing, you cannot secure yourself 100%, usually take a risk, but now if that risk is going to cost you capital, you become a bit more cautious. So yes, there, there are certain things that could derail us. But uh, by and large, the gov I, I believe if the government is to implement its plans, especially unroll and, and unpack this big force, that can really pull this country into, into a growth, in, into a growth uh, phase. And uh, as you know, when governments start spending and spending right, it pulls all the other sectors of the economy. So that is what makes me a bit that this year we'll be seeing a little bit more growth than we saw last year. 
projections is a GDP growth of 6%, which I believe can be, can be maintained. And uh, it's, it's just a matter of uh, the right structures and the right spending through the government, and the public sector follows suit.